Okay, here we are now in scene four, right? We learned in scene three about the plot against Hamlet's life. Um, we are near Elsinore, okay? Um, so we're still in Denmark. Um, and Fortinbras is entering with his army, okay? So this is young Fortinbras, remember? The, the guy who's parallel to Hamlet, the, the prince of the dead king. Okay, so um, the Fortinbras uh, asks one of his captains to send a message to uh, the Danish king. That would be, of course, Claudius, saying to him that I crave an escort um, through his kingdom. All right, um, and they go on. Okay, and uh, Hamlet is present. Hamlet, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. So apparently they're you know, on their way to go to the port, to get on the ship to go to England, but they haven't yet left, of course. They're still here in Denmark, okay? Um, and uh, Hamlet asks questions. Um, who are these people? And the captain says, they, these are from Norway. Um, what are they doing here? And he says, we are uh, going uh, to fight against some part of Poland, all right? Um, who commands them, Hamlet asks. Notice these are, we're once again returning to all these interrogatives. Um, so, uh, and we learn that it's the nephew to old Norway, um, Fortinbras, the young Fortinbras, okay? So he's the commander of this army, all right? Um, and Hamlet asks, are you fighting against the main part of Poland or just some other frontier, okay? Um, and, and Hamlet, uh, the captain responds, you know, what you've said is is true, that we're just going, um, I don't need to uh, add anything to that. Um, we are going to gain a little patch of ground that hath in it no profit but the name, okay? Um, so we're basically all doing a bunch of fighting for something worthless. Um, I wouldn't pay five ducats to farm it. Um, so... Uh, it's basically we're going to fight over a worthless plot of land. But the Polish are defending it, um, and, uh, and that's what we have, okay? So that's what Hamlet learns about the scenario. So basically you have um, Norway, Fortinbras of Norway leading an army of men to fight over some worthless plot of land in Poland, all right? And now everybody leaves, and Hamlet is left alone for a soliloquy, um, and this soliloquy, in my mind, I always parallel it with the soliloquy that Hamlet delivers after his encounter with the players. Remember there, he really berates himself, um, and says that, you know, what a worthless ass am I for, you know, this, this guy can show all this emotion for Hecuba and Hecuba means nothing to him. And here I am with real cause and I can't do anything for my dead father. He does something very similar here, but instead of comparing himself to the players, he's, of course, comparing himself to the soldiers he's just encountered, all right? Um, he starts off with a more general reflection, how all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge, right? So he's saying, look, at everything seems to be conspiring against me. Um, my revenge has grown dull, but it's kind of being spurred on. He now really starts to reflect on the nature of humanity. You'll notice in this play, we've had a lot of these reflections on what it means to be human. Um, and he said, look, if all we did was sleep and feed, then we would be a beast. Um, but now we have so much more. We have large discourse. We have capability and godlike reason. Okay. Um, and now Hamlet starts to really think about why he hasn't been able to commit his revenge and commit himself to revenge. He says he's been thinking too precisely on the event. Basically, he's kind of been overthinking it. Um, he's been thinking too much about it. Um, and so now he imagines, imagine a thought that you've quartered. So if you uh, take a thought and cut it in fourths, um, his thought has one part wisdom and then three parts coward, 
right? So he's basically saying for every little bit of wisdom I have, it's matched by three parts of cowardice, all right? And he's, again, he's really strong, causes this, like he has this self-doubt and self-reflection. He says, I don't know why I live to say the things to do. Like, why, am I, why do I still not do it? Um, I have cause, I have will, I have strength, I have means. There are examples that exhort me. Um, and here is an example. Now he launches into the example of the army that exhorts him. And he says, look at this army um, that is launching themselves, led by a delicate and tender prince. Remember that delicate and tender prince is like Hamlet, right? The nephew of an uncle who's in charge, the son of a deceased king, okay? Um, and they're finding this way to fight death and dare danger, even for an eggshell, right? For something worthless. Um, and how am I then? I have a father who's been killed, a mother stained, excitements of my reason and my blood, and I let all sleep. I don't do anything. Um, and to my shame, I see the death of 20,000 men um, before this little plot of land are sacrificing their lives. Okay? And now we've seen this plenty of times. I mean, I don't know to what extent you guys believe this anymore, but we've seen it so many times. But Hamlet comes to a resolution. After seeing the soldiers, now he's determined. Oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. Right? So now he's saying... Now I'm going to toughen up. I'm finally going to do it. I'm going to be, uh, my thoughts won't be worth anything unless my thoughts are bloody. Okay. Um, that is the last we see of Hamlet before he boards the ship for England. Um, and so uh, it, in his absence, we'll be filling in with some of the uh, material that's going on in his absence. Okay. Some of the different dynamics in the court. All right, please like this on YouTube and be sure to subscribe.